Welcome to Becoming Parents Podcast. I'm Jen Taylor, your host. I am mom of 18, and you can find me on momsrunningit.com. Remember, give a shout out to those who are brave enough to share their stories with us on how they have become parents. Let's dive right in. Welcome to Becoming Parents. Today, I have Jamie Finn on. Jamie, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I, you know, I've followed you for a while. I don't want to say stalked like it's a bad thing, (laughs) but I followed you for a while because we're both moms that have a lot. I mean, we're both moms, period, but we have some things in common that I just love. I want to jump into actually your websites. You have fosterthefamily.org. And from there, you have like the blog, the podcast, you have a lot of things. And then you also have the book website and you have goods and better store jump in on all of those and what they are and and maybe end with the book which i bought today on my oh great yay great yeah so the org website is because i serve as executive director of foster the family which is an organization a 501c3 that supports foster and adoptive parents um specifically in practical ways, when a child is first placed in the home, we are showing up at the doorstep of a foster family with everything that that child needs. So you being a former foster parent, you know, a child shows up with potentially nothing nothing or things that don't fit, or certainly things that need to go right in the wash. And so we have the goal of a foster parent really just being able to connect with that child, not having to worry about running to the store and getting things, not worrying about making dinner. So we're showing up with dinner also. Wow. And the, the desire is that first of all, the family is supported. They are able right away to just focus on the child and the child feels welcomed. The child has things that are theirs. They're coming into this new home and right away, something belongs to them. It's them. Hopefully it makes them smile on this hardest of days. And so that is how we're starting. And then our real focus is on long-term holistic care. So we are looking to envelop that whole family, the child, the parents into our network of support, our community of support groups and education, mentorship, trainings, and special events really to bless and create a community for the whole family. So that is what Foster the Family does on a local basis. And we do this in New Jersey, the DMV, DC area, Baltimore, and we're launching a branch in Grand Rapids in a few months. And we also have support groups around the country where foster parents are coming and finding their people and getting a little bit of training, but having a lot of community with other foster parents. We put on a retreat for foster and adoptive parents called the Field Retreat. I have a podcast, Real Mom Podcast. You mentioned Goods and Better Store, which is products that are really meant for people who are in this world of caring for children and the money is funneled right back into the work. So it's really a business with a mission. And then finally, I am the author of a new book, Foster the Family. And Foster the Family is a book for Christian and foster parents. It is really just taking principles from God's word and applying it to the journey of foster care. So really specific lessons about things like visits and saying goodbye Mm -hmm. and navigating the system. And a lot of what we've learned in our eight years of being foster parents and walking through the beautiful and the happy and the wonderful, and then the terrifying and the heartbreaking parts of being a foster parent. You said that that was my, that was my intro. It got a little long. Oh, yay. No, I love it. And when you said the terrifying, I got chills up and down my whole body Sure. when, when, and I don't want to discourage anyone from being a foster parent because it was one of the best decisions I made. I knew innately it was something I was going to do. Uh, you probably had the same experience and coming from a Christian back background, like both of us do, like I just knew. Yeah. It was part of, it was like a part of my faith walk or, um, 
my God journey or like a lot of things, but like, there was no question. I just knew. And for, for people that vacillate on that decision, it, there, it is hard. There are the hard, there are the hard. And I think it's worth it. Even with the hard, it was worth it. Absolutely. I mean, the first chapter of the book is why foster care is worth it. It's, it's me and my friends chatting about just how hard some of this stuff is Uh, and kind of like, what did we do to our life? Like, why did we do this? But just the real belief that it is worth it because kids are family, kids are worth it. Families are worth it. Living for God is worth it. And Mm -hmm. just believing that, but yeah, it is, it is hard. hard. And I wasn't like a, I knew that I was going to do this. I, I always, we always kind of talked about adoption as like something we might do one day, something we would probably do one day, but you don't fall into adoption. It's a choice. It's a, as much as we talk about it, like it's a calling. And I think in some way it is, Mm -hmm. we also, I think that makes it like this inaccessible, supernatural, like I was called instead of like, oh, I'm going to use my life and my home and my family as a a mission field for loving kids and their families. And that's a choice that we opt into and we can kind of demystify it when we're just like, yeah, this is something that I feel like is right. Mm -hmm. Something I feel like I'm capable of doing right now. And so we're going to jump in. And our goal was one kid, one time. And it's become 27 kids over eight years. So I never kept track of the kids that came through. I, I do want to spend some time here. I want to know your story of having kids and because I don't know, it was there infertility. Did you have biological kids? And then it's definitely a choice. I mean, I felt so strongly that it was something that I wanted to do but it was still, you still have to make the choice. There's no magic. And even when you go through the licensing and I always tell people, if you're interested, do the licensing because it's Mm. not fast and easy. Like it, like it takes some time. Great point. Right. Part of the journey of maybe figuring it out for your family. Right. And if you decide not to, it's like no harm, no foul. You've wasted some time knowing there's no question anymore, but do it because you, that takes time and effort. And then within that, when you get called with kids, you don't have to say yes. Yeah. And you don't always get called right away. I didn't get called right. I thought like, okay, we're, we're out of this class, bring on the kids. And yeah, sure. It was crickets, right? So it doesn't mean they're going to contact you immediately. And it doesn't mean you have to say yes. And it is part of that questioning. So I, I'm encouraging my, families out there who are questioning it to start taking the classes. Yeah. But that's part of potentially discovering if it's right for you or how it's right for you. Right. I mean, there might be some people who adopt 10 kids and there might be others who one time welcome a child or are ready to be provide respite, which is essentially like a long-term babysitting for Mm -hmm. a foster family, but it's so important in supporting those of us who are in this for a long time. We need the support of others. So I love that. Yeah. I mean, if you are like, what should we do? What should we do? do? Move forward and then keep asking the questions as you move forward. And there are so many specialties, quote specialties, like you said, respite's one, medically fragile kids is another one, infants, emergency care. I mean, like the list goes on and on and on. And so you may not be a traditional foster parent the way you think it's going to be. You could look into it and go, oh, I'm actually really drawn to this, or I really love this aspect. And yeah, or I have room for one teenager in my home, or I have room for one infant that you get to create those parameters of what you feel like your family is able to offer, how you feel like you can serve a child in need while also prioritizing and protecting your family. Those questions don't have to go out the window. It's not just like, sign me up. I'm, you know what, bring me whatever we can still be really considering what the right things for our family and for the kids we'd be able to serve are. One thing I've heard from foster parents or parents that are going through the foster parent progress process is, you know, you have to fill out the paperwork and it's kind of like, it's really deflating for some people to fill it out. You feel like, like you're not picking out a puppy here, you know? Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that, like you just said, you set the parameters, you have boundaries. I didn't want to take kids with fetal alcohol syndrome, for example. 
some people really, like you said, only one teenager or only a baby, or like I had only little girls in the beginning. So I didn't want to take teenage boys who sure. had been sexually abused. Like there are so many parameters to this too. And to just remember that, like you, you can't be everything to everyone. So exactly that paperwork is really, really important in what you can handle and what you can't to make it the most successful. So talk yeah. about the pa- that for you. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that paperwork, you can feel a lot of guilt and shame yes. and pressure. I think that paperwork is mostly helpful for you. I mean, my experience is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. your worker's not looking at that paperwork anyway. They're calling you about what they have. Everything. <laughs> right. But yeah. it's helpful for you to determine oh, you know what? This is beyond what we can handle. We have a bunch of teenagers and we are out at sports all the time. A toddler, that's not going to work in, in prioritizing and protecting my family as well. And I think that there's too much of an all or nothing perspective sometimes in how we think about foster care, where really it's an opportunity to serve. Are you able to serve? How are you able to serve? Create those parameters and don't see it as saying no to kids, seeing it, see it as saying yes to the ones you're saying yes to. I always felt like if I took a child, like if I really just felt like it was not a good fit and you said no, not only that, like I'm robbing someone else of their blessing of having of their, their, yes. their child. Right. Yes. Of their, yep. yes. And so it didn't, I mean, you're hurt, you hurt for these kids in your heart always forever, right? Sure. You, but you bringing in the wrong ones means that it's a potentially not okay situation that you have to backpedal in and it, and it's robbing someone else. So yeah. I don't know which direction you want to go. This is your story. So I don't know if you want to tell your biological journey and the journey to decide to do foster care. And then there's the journey to with the nonprofit and the clo- like all the websites. Yeah. The let's support. talk about our family. I love to, yay, to just yay. talk about our foster care journey. Okay. Yeah. So you hinted at um, how and why did we become foster parents? Was there sort of infertility? And that is a part of a lot of people's story. Yes. It raises the question for people of, like, okay, I know that I have love to give. I know we have room in our home and our unit to welcome kids and it's not happening for us biologically. And that can sort of be the catalyst. Like the, it's what gets it going in someone's mind. It's tricky because I think it can be really hard if you do struggle with infertility and you are, or and miscarriage and you are looking to build your family foster care is at its core, a bridge back to forever family or potentially on to forever family, meaning birth family or adoptive family. And so a lot of foster parents do adopt. You adopted, we adopted, and that can happen some of the time, but it's not the primary goal. The primary goal of foster care is reunification. It's family preservation, it's family reunification, And so if you have infertility and miscarriage as part of your journey, I think it takes a lot of discernment of knowing exactly how you can open your heart and home while also maintaining commitment to that goal of a family being made whole. And I think that can be particularly painful if you want to build your family. And so I think that's, that's one thing to consider, but we did not have that as part of our story. We had, um, our daughter and our son, they were about five and two. And for us, it was really more about using our home and family and lives and hearts to serve others. And we just felt like to whom much is given much is expected that we just had this beautiful family and support system and, and, that we wanted to use that to really love on other children and their families. And so it was more of like a a mission for us. Like this is something we want to do with our lives and family. But my husband was very hesitant. He was a reluctant foster parent for sure. I was driven by passion. He was driven by conviction. So the goal was one kid, one time. And we actually had the unusual experience of our first placement becoming our forever daughter through adoption. And so we have adopted two of our children. I'll go through the list of the breakdown of the kids. 
I have one biological daughter who's 13, one biological son who's 10. And then our adopted daughters are eight and seven. They are not biological siblings, but we adopted them the same day. And yeah, it was oh, an wow. unusual experience. They were in our home for different amounts of time, but their adoption workers worked together and they were like, we're going to make this happen. We're going to like finish the family and in, in one sitting. And so that was really sweet. And then we had an unexpected addition to our family through an adoptive placement and he will be adopted June 7th. Oh, so yeah, he's, he's 21 months and he'll be officially joining our family June 7th, even though he's been with us since birth. So that's my five kids. And then in the middle of that was also another 25 or so kids who've come and gone as right. our foster children. So. Oh, that's so good. So it was a sibling of one of the kids you adopted. No, it actually wasn't. Oh. It was, it was just a call, but they knew right away that they were calling about an adoptive placement. Got now, it. even there, there was a little bit of a roller coaster. Cause at one point it was like, Oh, did we find someone and what's the, the plan here? But there, um, sadly there's no one in, in his family, in his story who was able to, to be his forever. So we get to be his forever. Oh, I love it. I want to talk about the adoptions. Now my first placement was adoptive too, which is interesting. I hadn't even thought about that, but um, some states, it varies from state to state. Some states in the state that I was in did a foster adoption program. So yeah. you could be in traditional foster care where, like you said, 25 have come and gone, or you could be specifically in the kids who have have had or are close to termination, which means termination yep. of parental rights. And those children in our state were called free, which means free to adopt. And I really wanted to focus on that. Although you end mm -hmm. up doing, like I ended up doing Sure. respite and like you do sure, other stuff. Sure. Um, with adoptions and even when termination looks like it's going to happen and you can have this foster child for a long time in foster care and then yeah. maybe you want to adopt yes predominantly in foster care they look for family placements mm -hmm. so while that child's with you and they're discussing adoption potential mm -hmm. adoption they're searching the nation for fan relatives that are willing mm -hmm. to adopt and you can like lose that child for a family placement or you know i mean th sometimes things do fall through and did you ever experience anything like that i'm sure you work with people that do because that can be really hard absolutely and and that's why i mentioned that when we were talking about sort of building your family through foster care is yeah. i think you have to be really careful with that so there's two ways to look at foster adoption one is and to be frank it's not a term that i love i think some states have a strong foster to adopt program i i prefer to say foster care with a willingness to adopt mm -hmm. because there are two ways that it primarily happens. One is a child is in my home for a long time. Parental rights are terminated. They're seeking family, hopefully the whole time, but sometimes often they're not really seeking family until termination is about to happen. And so even though you've had one to three years with this child, it still may end up being permanence with another family. So I, that's the one way is, okay, I'm a foster parent. And that foster care journey eventually evolves into adoption. The other is sort of like you're talking about, but even there, unless you are pursuing a waiting child, meaning a right. child whose rights have already been terminated. And to be frank, these children are just as worthy of being adopted. They are, they are precious souls, but they are not the ones who most people are going down a checklist going, Oh yeah, this fits uh -huh. my checklist. They are children who would be deemed hard to place. Yep. They would be children who are coming with more significant needs or part of a big sibling set or something yep. like that. And a lot of people are not willing to deal with the risk involved in foster adoption and not willing to deal with the high level of care involved in 
adopting a, a waiting child. And so I think there's a lot of, as much as I'm like, there are these waiting children, there are these children who are about to be waiting, everyone jump in and let's adopt. <laughs> It's not that simple. And I think it takes a lot of defining what you believe you are open to, you're called to, what you're willing to do. And for my family, I think the unique hard that we're willing to take on is the instability of foster care, the lack of control in these kids in deciding their everyday decisions sometimes, but certainly they're the fate of where they're going to be, that that is what we feel like we have faith for, like we're able to do, we are able to sort of lack control and say goodbye. And it's heartbreaking. It's devastating. No part of it is easy, but because that's the part that we feel like we have faith for, we know there are other people who are on the waiting side of that, of like, okay, now this child is ready to be adopted. Rights have been terminated or about to be, and we can jump in. So again, I would encourage people, you can jump in and start to figure out what that is for you as yep. you're in, as you're in, you can say like, oh no, no, we, we are not able to say goodbye again, or, oh no, no, we are not able to deal with, uh, a, a child with such high level needs mm-hmm. with the other things going on in our family, but we can do that as we're engaging the system, not from back here, not yeah. from just watching and waiting. We can actually engage the system and figure that out as we go. The, I love that you said that about the foster adoption programs, because in your mind, you're in it for the long haul. And when it doesn't work, and I, I know I didn't feel this way, but man, it's hard when it doesn't work out and you've had a child for long-term or child that, you know, you think is going to be forever in your home. It's a, it's a different emotional process than just the kids that come into foster care and kind of come and go like the 25 that you've had. You know, it's those you kind of expect. And when it ends up a, an opportunity to adopt and you want to, it's like a, a fun, hap- a surprise, happy ending. But the opposite is really tough. Yeah, we we said goodbye to our daughter after two and a half years and she was in the adoption unit. So we were moving forward with adoption and it changed. And I think what's hard is there is a deep grief and loss in that. And she was able to reunify because her mom was able to get healthy. And so to just hold on to the grief means not celebrating Mm -hmm. that this little girl gets to be with her mom forever. And that there was healing in her mom and healing in her family. And, and she, you know, we are adoptive moms. We love adoption. And yet no one knows more than us and our kids, the trauma that's involved in adoption. And so as much as there was just grief for us, there, there has to be celebration also for the healing of a family. And that takes a lot of wrestling with what we believe about the family, that we believe the family is worth it. We believe that the family is worth fighting for, and we want to jump in with our support. And I write about that a lot in the book, because that was the biggest shift for me. When I came into foster care, it was all about the kids. It was just about protecting children from these bad parents and finally showing them love. And this very simplistic and to be frank, arrogant and ignorant perspective. And that was the biggest shift for me, a shift on understanding the sanctity of family and the role that I can play in a family being made whole again. And so I share a lot about that in the book, because that was a, a huge part of our journey. I love that in the beginning, you talked about how reunification is the number one goal. And I think people need to keep that in the forefront of their mind. And you're, yeah. you are reiterating that right now with that. I mean, now I know in the state of Nevada, where I am, they are doing more connecting with the foster parents and the biological mm-hmm. parents. There used to be this massive gap where you never yep. saw them or talk to them. Yep. And I've had a bad experience with that and a good experience with that. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, like it's, it's not a perfect, I feel like sometimes it's a broken system that's doing the best that it can with a lot of broken people who are also yeah. trying to do the best that they sure. can. Statistically, I know Nevada connects because when the foster and the biological parents are kind of 
a unified front. Mm -hmm. It can help those biological parents get healthy faster. Yep. Who reunify. And this is something that's, like you said, there's an arrogance. There's a lot in it. There's a lot of emotion in that because we read the rap sheet, basically. You know, when you get yes. presented with the child, you get the we, worst of the worst. We, you, you read police reports and uh, medical reports and hospitals and 911 calls. And when they drop the kids off, sometimes, you know, if the police, I've had the police drop them off in the middle of the night as an emergency, like there's so many things and you are seeing the worst and you want to save these kids from X, Y, Z. And then you have, then you get to, you meet the biological parents to help them reunify. And it's hard. It is yeah. a hard thing to navigate. Like uh, I have all this information and I don't want to like this person. I don't want to help mm-hmm. this person. And it's all part of, you have to really kind of separate all of those pieces out for the best result for that child. Yeah. And again, that is the, you know, the book foster the family is not parenting methods, right? It's not as much about the kids. It's about us and the way we think, the way we wrestle through hard things, the way that we consider our kids' parents, because there is so much work that needs to be done, just like you're saying, of yeah. wrestling through our our fears and our judgments and our worries and and getting to a right place in the way that we consider our kids, their parents, the system. And that's what I share in the book is just all of the wrestling that I did. And I would say I started off in the wrong place in most of the ways, and I haven't arrived at all, but I've had to do so much work in, in really reorienting to the why reorienting how I do it. And it's been a process for me. It's been a journey. Tell me about the journey with you two as a couple and your husband's journey. I know I'm not asking you to speak for him, but just kind of your perspective, because you started off from very different places mm-hmm. and foster care can be a beautiful thing and a hard thing. It's also changes your relationship. Sure. Yeah. I, I think for us, it has been such a joy to watch my husband who I would say is not like naturally a bleeding heart naturally like, Oh, let me come and take care of you. He is protective of our unit. And I would say like a ducks in a row kind of person. And so jumping into something where you lose control, the way that foster care does that to see him lean into that and to see him really choose discomfort for the good of others. And that discomfort could look like having six kids with a lot of needs. It could look like having a mom in our home for Christmas. It could look like him managing behaviors that we didn't even know children were capable of. And it has become, there is no sort of like, you did this to us. It is this, like, we are on mission as a family and this is our joy. This is our a big part of, of our DNA as a family unit. And so I think what we've experienced by the grace of God is this leaning into each other. I think like any trial, you know, when you read the statistics of parents who are raising kids with special needs, they're terrifying. (laughs) And I think that those numbers could echo for a lot of foster parents, a lot of adoptive parents, parents who are parenting through trauma and other hard things is hard things are going to pull you apart or push you together. And you have to be fighting for it to push you together. You have to be fighting for carrying the other one when they're struggling, reminding the other one when they're forgetting, being that, that encouragement and pulling them back into the why and the mission and helping that their hearts reorient too. And I feel so grateful to have a real teammate in that. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not the case for all couples. And I know that there are heroes of single foster parents who jump Mm -hmm. in this on their own, but I'm grateful for the team that my husband and I are together in this. Tell me, I want to wrap up with kind of tying in from the beginning, the websites. Um, I mean, obviously I really feel strongly why you wrote the book. It's 
you know, it's kind of an extension of who you are in my mind, but at what point in the foster care journey, you said eight years, did you jump on and help people? And, and I want to, I want to know that. And then the easiest way people can get in touch with you. Sure. So a lot of this happened by accident. I was, we became new foster parents and I was approached by someone in our church who said, can you write an article about foster care? I didn't have like wisdom or experience to share, but I just had our brand new story and I shared it. And he said, you should start a blog. You should put this on the internet. And I did. And I, it was viewed millions of times in a few days. And so I did not have the experience or the wisdom behind it, but I had people who were listening and watching. And so I decided to just start sharing the stumbling and struggling of being a foster parent and just sharing what we were learning as we went. And that evolved into a a blog. It involved, it evolved into having more of a voice in this like national online space, which then meant I was being invited to come and speak to foster parents and to write for other people and all of that. And I felt this conviction that I was flying other places to talk about foster care and get to know other foster parents. And yet I had these foster parents in my community that I was not in relationship with, and I was not doing anything to serve them. So it just shifted for me of like, okay, how can I be faithful here in South Jersey? How can I support foster families here? And just from there went to dreaming of like, okay, what are the ways I've felt the need for support? Yeah. What are the the gaps that have been there for me? And for me, it was that immediate emergency, like, okay, the runs to target at 11 o'clock when you just welcomed a new kid and you're scared and tired that is something that other people can jump into. And not only do I need the help there, but it's also an opportunity for them. All those people who are saying to me, I've always wanted to be a foster parent, but it's not the right time. Hey, guess what? We have a way for you to engage in the system and engage with these families now. So just started dreaming up the kind of support that I wanted and needed and started our work here in South Jersey four years ago. And we've been serving families for the past four years. And then over the past two years or so, we is when we started branching to other locations and we have 15 support groups around the country right now. And we're launching 25 more in a couple of months. And we, our hope is that we continue to do that just to give great resources and a great infrastructure to willing leaders at locations around the country so that we can just be expanding our reach of support to foster families because it can be very lonely. It can be very confusing. And we believe that community is the biggest need that most foster parents have. So I have been so grateful to not only get to be a foster parent for the past eight years, but to jump into sort of back into the trenches with other foster parents uh, for the past four years or or so through foster the family. I'm so grateful that you did because once you're a foster parent, you know, you know what you really need, you know, where the gaps are. What is the easiest way for people to get in touch with you for more information? Yeah, I am most active on Instagram at foster the family blog. You can find me the same place on Facebook at foster the family blog or the blog at www.fosterthefamilyblog.com. And then the organization is Mm fosterthefamily.org and the shop is goodsandbetterstore.com. But also the family. Exactly. Google foster the family and you'll find me. You'll find me. (laughs) Jamie, thank you so much for being on today. I love your story. I appreciate it. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for having me. It's fun to talk to a foster parent, a former yeah. foster parent who, who knows what we're discussing. Like, you know, it from the inside out. And so I appreciate you having me. And I hope that it encourages other people to consider jumping into this.